the diamond sutra meditation the missing dimension meditation the missing dimension as a person we spend 25 to 27 years of our life youth in university campus learning various disciplines preparing ourselves for life ahead of us after completing the university education spending 25 to 27 years of our precious life we are given degrees honors credentials many kind of accolades and it is said now you are ready to enter the practical world when we come out of the university campus and enter into the the real aspect of life do we have answers to simple questions that life asks on a day to day basis do we have simple answers to the questions that life asks on a day to day basis it teaches us many things but it fails to recognize that we do not understand what life really means and when traversing a long life's roads many situation comes for which there is no answer it means there is something missing in that education system certainly there is something missing in that education system and that which is missing is the dimension of meditation without the dimension of meditation all university education all those credentials are meaningless then we have to look for outside sources to add first we do not know what is that actually missing in our lives we have been a 10 pointer a very intelligent student but if that dimension was added to the education from the very beginning from the moment the child is born if he is introduced to this dimension of life the essential aspect of life life will move in a totally different way then you have to to start the journey of learning once again in a different way we use various tools when you sit silently watching your breath this is one way you are connected to the unconscious layers through the mind you are connected to suppressed emotions both at personal and social level also you are connected to the muscles in the physical system of karma then you can clear out every knot and thus clear the body of all the karmas past accumulated So this series of talks 
will begin. In certain ways, first I will explain what is meditation and what it is not. And then meditation, the ultimate in healing, how the understanding and the awareness of meditation can bring about the process of transformation in human life. In the past, there had been universities at Nalanda and Takshila, the Buddhist universities, where meditation was an important aspect of the entire education system. With the passage of time, it has vanished from the system. When I talk about the ancient universities or ancient system, I do not want to take you back to those times. Instead, something of that time which was relevant and has helped the seekers along the path, we must learn and adapt it in, in changing circumstances of modern times. With this talk, I invite you for a strange and long pilgrimage. The journey will end only where you already are. In the process, you will have to move through many steps and paths just to come to yourself, to discover your true nature. Because you have moved away from yourself, it is important to bring you back to you, to establish a connection. You have forgotten the way back home. I am then a reminder, a remembrance of the lost home and the path. Meditation is purely scientific in its nature. When I am speaking on these talks, the words overflow. The words are simply the container. Along with that, the energy field. If you translate this energy field that overflows through these words, In something tangible, it is the compassion. Why do I have to come, wake up in the morning, prepare and get ready to come to speak to you? What is my gain? There is no financial gain in that. It's just one day I was stumbling, searching for the door in darkness and then one day it happened. So it is a responsibility, a commitment that I must share my insights my compassion with those who are also searching for the path, for the door. It is the energy field that flows through the words. Just as when you breathe fresh air, the air is the medium and the energy particles that flows with the air. William Reich has called these as Orbun, Pranvayu, a life force, or Alan White, that really works within you. If you 
do an experiment. Do not focus on understanding what I am saying. Instead, use it as a musical harmony overflowing from the innerness of a living Buddha, the song of the flute, the clarion call, with headphone keeping your eyes closed, you will realize and you will find that for some time you have disappeared, you do not know, you know that you have not fallen asleep. The body becomes still, the breathing will become very, almost like still as if you are not breathing. Even at this moment as I am speaking, as this overflow is happening, something is settling down deep within. The breathing that was chaotic at the time is slowly and slowly getting into a rhythm. Although I am using the talk, but this talk is not a mere talk. Instead, it is a communion of energy and the words are the medium. The sound is used as a medium to create a bridge between my inner silence, my innerness and your innerness. But meditation is purely scientific in nature. Science is based on observation of objects and when you move inwards, it is the same observation. The only difference is that now you have taken a 180 degree turn. Instead of looking outwards on the objects and beings, you are looking within. You are looking into the various corners of the mind. Adi Shankar has pointed out in his Nirvana's Shatkam, the first line, Mano Buddha Ahankar Chittani Nahu Man Buddhi Ahankar Chit these are the four aspects of the mind and we continue to prowl around these four aspects of the mind. Mind, one is the broader sense and mind also means, refers to the micro aspect and for which the ancient inner scientists have said Dhyanam Nirvishayam Mana is that state of mind which is free of all kind of inertia that can obstruct the light to manifest. If in the path of the light there are many obstructions, the light will not reach to its source. This is what in Vedanta known as Vishay. The impressions that have been cast on your mind in the form of memory and other things, the ego sense. So Mano Buddha Ahanka Chittan Nahu. I am neither the mind nor intellect, nor a storehouse of the memory, nor the ego sense. 
ego sense many have given it different names some said khudi ahankar ego sense sufis have explained seven stages of ego sense comprehensive analysis so when the process of meditation begins you are moving within you are trying to look into various aspects of the mind and that is what is called meditation it is not a belief not a faith not a ritual instead a science an experiment not in the outer world of objects and beings instead in the inner world of the experiment meditation is a science that has been known and explored by the mystics for centuries and misunderstood by the masses for just as long meditation is not the process of knowledge that can be acquired from the books but an experience to which words are pointing and can only be transmitted by one who has lived them meditation cannot be taught instead it can be taught once you are in the company of someone who is meditating just remaining around him something begins to settle as you are listening to this talk or even after as you listen something as you begin no matter how disturbed you are by the time you end by the time the talk ends something will settle deep within you this is the communion you are within the energy field of an awakened one the living one modern man this can only be transmitted by one who has lived them they can be passed on from a master to a disciple disciple is one who is ready who is receptive who is moving from head to heart he is vulnerable he is ready to absorb the rain clouds when it showers but the modern man has forgotten what meditation is as a result he has substituted rituals and beliefs in its place one can have glimpses of meditation suddenly when you are struck by beauty or you are dumb with love you are in a different realm but you have been taught and conditions to look outwards for everything so much so that looking within has become impossible in the last century it was the mystic raman who had emphasized the aspect of looking within and that is the entire teaching of hindu scriptures vedas look within for meditation no god no scripture is needed even an atheist can meditate just 
as anybody else because meditation is simply turning inwards, walking through the innerness, it is said. A oft used scriptural invention, dhyanam nirvishayam manah. Meditation is the English word that does not encompass the entire aspect of meditation. Dhyan is more important. Nanak in one of the compositions says there are five organs of perception and five organs of actions through which we interact into the outer world of objects and beings. You are listening to me as well as you are seeing me. You have recognized the voice. You have heard it several times, but you do not know the feels. Eyes see something, they transmit this information, this sensation to your innerness. Then the ears also give you an information. The two information from diverse reporters has come to you. What is that which ascertains that the person that you are listening and the person that you are watching is the same. This is Dhyan. That faculty which coordinates, assimilates the activities of all the reporters the organs of action and organs of perception. The actual composition that Guru Nanak has used, Panch Pardhan, Panch Parwan, Panche Pavai Dargai Man, Pancha Ka Guru Ekyam. There are five organs of perception and five organs of actions that are constantly at play. And dhyana or the meditation is the master of these five. Meditation is an incomplete word. It does not explain much about the context for which it is used. Dhyana is more appropriate and comprehensive. Dhyan is a state of mind when there is no desire, no thought. Desire gives birth to thought and thus continues the mind and its noise. To explain more about meditation, I will take a Zen code. First, if you do not know what is Zen, let me explain. Zen is that aspect of the message of Buddha that developed in Japan after Buddha's message evolved in China as Chan. It went to Japan and there it came to be known as Zen. Buddha's message went through the process of initiation, integration and innovation before evolving into Zen. It happened one day Buddha came to Avanti Park near Shravasti 
He had a flower in his hand. Buddha never did anything like this before. He stood up there with a flower in his hand. Now, if you stand up with a flower in your hand and do not speak, that many kind of thoughts will arise in the minds of the people who are watching you. And it's all those, every monk began the process of, process within, process of thought, thinking what does Buddha mean by having this flower in his hand. There was one among all the monks called Mahakashyap. He remained quiet. There was no thought, instead there was emptiness. It is Buddha who has come for the discourse. I am receptive. When the rain clouds begin to shower, there is only one thing in the earth is receptivity. The earth is receptive to absorb as the raindrops shower from the clouds. There is no thinking, nothing. Buddha handed over the flower to Mahakashyap and it is said that was the beginning of Zen Buddhism. So I will take a Zen comb Cone implies a small riddle or a story through which master conveys the message. Just as Sufis use parable and there are many stories that contains the important message and these are mentioned in Hindu scriptures. A new disciple came to Master Joshu and asked, Master, I have recently entered your communion and I am willing to learn the first sutras, the principle of Dhyan. This is the way the dialogue that took place between Joshu and the disciple. It is a dialogue, not a conversation. A dialogue happens between a knower and an aspirant. A conversation happens between two ignorant ones. Joshua inquired, Did you have your evening meals? How do you find a connection? The disciple is inquiring about meditation dhyan, and Joshu the master inquires, Did you have your evening meals? The disciple replied, Yes, I did. Joshu replied, Then go and wash your plate. You may wonder what is this? There are certain things that cannot be explained directly. Certainly there are things that cannot be explained directly. Now let me take you into the, this, the explanation. This simple story, a cone, contains the essence of life, austerities, and explains the process what meditation is all about. It implies that if all your desires have vanished and you have taken the final meal, then go and wash your plate. This is what is meant by the Sanskrit injunction, Dhyanam Nirvishayam Manam. The desires that you want to acquire this, acquire that. Whatsoever comes naturally will happen. 
But once you go on hankering for this, you are moving away from meditation into the outer world of objects and beings. It implies if all your desires have vanished and you have taken the final meal, then go and wash your plates. If the desires of the world have vanished, then wash your mind. And this is the essence of Gyan. This is the essence of meditation. Let me explain Dhyan before entering into Sutra. Your mind is working constantly and effortlessly round the clock. Even while you are sleeping, waking, dreaming, resting, or walking with every action, the tired mind goes on gathering layers of dust. Every process of mind creates a cloud of smoke around your consciousness because fuel is needed in the process of the mind's functioning. You have heard a word from me. You are giving it your own interpretation. A confusion starts. You draw your own conclusion about me. Through that word that you have, or the message that you have heard from me, and a layer is created on your consciousness. A car passes by, you may not see the emission of a smoke, but it is released in the atmosphere and creates pollution. A lamp is lit, a smoke that is released pollutes the air. So too, the lamp of mind is lit, fuel is being consumed, because the lamp of mind burns burns not without fuel. You eat and drink and all this acts as fuel. Thus continues the burning of the lamp of your mind and the process of its lighting. The longer your lamp remains lit, the smoke is released polluting the inner sky with haze and the clouds, the vast sky of consciousness. Again, the mind continues to accumulate memories. There is a direct connection between your tongue and the memory. Through the tongue, you register many tastes and mind goes on accumulating all these tastes. So too, many kind of impressions are registered through the eyes, through the ears, through all the organs of perception and all these are stored in your memory. So even when it is not needed, the memory remains open like a Pandora's box. When you hear a word from an awakened one, it triggers the process and you react. Whatever you do or not forms a part of your memory. Moreover, all that you never did but only observed also forms a part of the memory. Scientists say, scientists say nearly one million impressions are recorded in your mind every moment. Every moment, one million impressions are recorded every moment. You cannot conceive of this 
but your mind records even the most insignificant event. Your conscious mind records only a few events, but the unconscious mind records the rest without your knowledge. I am overflowing, you are listening. This is happening to your conscious mind. A bird chirping, a car passing on the street, phone ringing, dog barking, a child crying, and many more such things are happening. But your attention is on my something is happening. Something is being recorded through the conscious mind and something is being recorded through the unconscious mind. Your mind will record all these happenings simultaneously and all these impressions of haze or dust or cloud covering your consciousness. So what is behind them? Dhyan, therefore, is the process of removing this dust that has gathered in your mind. So when Govindu Pad Acharya inquired from, the, from Adi Shankar who was wandering at eight, as an eight-year-old child in the Himalayan mountains, who are you? And in response to that, Shankar composed Nirvan Shakam Mano Buddhi Ahankar Chittani Naham. I am neither the mind nor intellect nor the storehouse of the memory nor the ego sense. Neither I am the five airs. And he goes on saying that I have no relation. And then, what is your nature? Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. I am eternal, unborn, unmanifest. Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. Shiv means that which is eternal, that which is the highest state of meditativeness. Shiva is not the aspect of the Hindu idol. The Trinity is the highest, the subtlest aspect of Shiva, is the ultimate in meditation, a constant state of awakening. Therefore, this process of removing the dust that goes on gathering on a day to day basis, you take a shower in the morning. Then you go out on various errands into your work, you gather dust, your clothes gets dirty, your skin gets dirty with perspiration and everything. What you do, you come back home. The first thing you do, you take a shower and refresh yourself. Meditation is like the process of taking a shower on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. This is the cause of your, this dust that you go on accumulating is the cause of your misery, sickness and agony. And the process of removing this dust is dhyan. Joshu is right. The disciple who has just entered the commune wanted to know about the first step, what is meditation. And Joshua would have looked towards the disciple, looked deep within the disciple who was ready and asked, inquired, if he had consumed the last meal and instructed him, then go and wash the plate. To you this will look absurd. Why can't he answer directly? A counterfeit master will jump immediately to answer directly. 
but the truly awakened one will hesitate. Many times people ask a question and they expect a direct answer, but I cannot give them. There is no receptivity and my answer will go on a barren soil. Unless the soil of your heart is prepared, it is not my words which are seeds will fall on the desert soil and will be blown away with the wind one day or the birds will eat. Therefore I hesitate. I have to look at all the levels of your inner preparation. The disciple is asking about dhyana or meditation, but the master says, go and wash your plate. What a strange reply. Truth cannot be put into the words. The word water will not quench your thirst. The word food will not fill your appetite. You see no difference. The word water and the substance that has the capability to quench your thirst are different and made up of different stuff as well. The master is aware of this. So he is bound to hesitate. He will not be vocal like your priest. He will have to create a situation and choose a poem, a parable or a story to explain. And a collection of these stories is known as Asaf's Fables. That is the English version of that. Through these stories, the mystics have tried to explain the intricate aspects of meditation. This process of meditation will continue. It is an unending process. 